Welcome back to Omicron. We go back into my live stream already in progress. Oh yeah, it's been quite some time. Welcome all you plus two comedy modifiers back to the stream. Welcome to Omicron. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, it's been like three months since I've played this game. I've been very busy with other projects. Uh, I've recently released my first horror short, uh, which by the time this is up on YouTube, that'll be available on the Plus Two Comedy channel. So yeah, check that out. Now that it's, by the time you're seeing this, it's probably like, I don't know, March? So get your Halloween on. In any case, last time I was here, uh, I was reading the long lore, and uh, now that we've started down this road, we must finish it. So welcome to another super long, I'm just gonna read episode. So as we left, left off, our, our hero was in dire straits, and uh, was looking for uh, help in any way, he was looking for someone to love him. He had fallen in love with this woman, and he had found something special, and uh, we're just gonna go and uh, read. So. <laughs> Get ready for that. Uh, I'm also pulling up the chat right now on my phone. Ooh, spooky. Uh, I also haven't set up the lights in a while, so as you can tell, I'm, I'm a little bit in the dark. But I'm pulling up the chat, uh, so if you want to read along with me, you can. And when you hear the chime, turn the page. All right, let's get into some reading while Twitch loads up on my phone. Um, this is the bottom. Let me go back to the top. Oh, God, the green screen. The green screen is so bad. I, I hate this look. Uh, I might actually turn off chroma key in, just entirely for, for the sake of this, because we've had this problem so many times. I'm going to turn off chroma key. I'm just... Uh, no, but then there's words you can't... Let's uh, this. I... I know somebody said something in the chat, but I can no longer see it. So say it again, and I'll read it here. All right, I'm actually going to do it. There, oh, there's people here. All right, I'm starting the stream over, so here we go. Welcome all you plus two comedy modifiers back to the stream. Welcome to Omicron. I haven't played this in quite some time. It's been like three months. So we're back to reading a bunch of lore. Uh, if you've missed the first episode, sorry. Uh, you can check it out on Plus Two Comedy Gaming eventually. Uh, but we're going to see what's going on uh, here in the world of Omicrog. Uh, hey! <laughs> Jeff Storm is in the chat. Hello. We're trying something new with the setup because my green screen doesn't want to work because I don't have lights that work very well. All right. <clears throat> A meeting in the woods. Yes, I'm just going to read this whole episode. When daylight broke, I could hear the chattering of chipmunks, even over my burning leg muscles. He, he's dead squats. Uh, my clothing were cut to shreds, and I walked among the low-hanging tree branches. I decided it would be best to find a hiding place, assisted by the light of day, then rest until nightfall. I found a large coiled branches above my head, <laughs> above head height in the tree. Okay. Uh, the nest was still warm, as if the occupant just left. Uh, there was no chatter of chipmunks. It was th this eerie, silent place. Then I saw several three-inch triangular teeth lying on the floor of the nest. It was the nest of the, of a, oh, I forgot. There's also lots of words that oh, don't exist in this. It shoot the end saw worm. I decided to find a new hiding place. Good call. Movement. I saw movement coming from the right perceptory. Next there was movement from the left. A white cylindrical shape crawling along the ground like a link of white cylinder crawled from a log just in front of me and the pieces were drawn to each other. It was the Ithuchu Thaw Worm assembling into a hole. Cool, I darted from it before it could come together, but I couldn't. Missing apostrophe, make it out of the clearing before the great worm exploded out of the ground in front of me. Its brutal maw was a spinning buzzsaw of triangular teeth. That doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> but okay. The head split open longwise, making the shape of a bear trap. 
The sawworm had seen the shape of a bear trap and it was the master of imitating other shapes because its nerve net of a brain had no creativity of its own. It became a bear trap, that's kind of cool. It's just like, it's like it's a bad green lantern. It lunged at me and then tumbled into a coil of white tubes, spitting and frothing. It was so hungry and desperate for me. The mouth spun and shot loose teeth at me and hit the tree behind me with a thunk, thunk, thunk. I looked for the best exit and admitted that I was in such a panic I couldn't, missing apostrophe, tell where I was or which way to go. But the solver was back underground. I took out the anominate's finger. This is a thing that like kills people when you touch it. The abominate. Uh, out of my pocket was ready for its resurfacing warm when I felt a tap on my shoulder. When I turned around, I was in such shock that I stood in awe. The enthusiast sawworm had reassembled into the image of my own likeness. Weird. It clearly was not me but it was the best image the saw worm could pull off. It couldn't match my chiseled jaw. Links of meat put together to build a frame stood there, aping my posture. Its eyes stared through me like a dead man. It looked, it looked to hold a finger in its hand just like me, okay. Before I could lunge at the creature, its mouth ripped open with its triangular teeth and shot out with a thunk into the wood beside me, thunk into my shoulder, and whiff off the grass behind me. The abominate's finger fell to the ground. I don't know where. That bad. The beast leapt upon me, and I put a hand on top of the bottom, on top and bottom of its jaw. As the saw blades spun and came towards my face, I reached up and felt the purple fuzzball. I turned my head away and everything went into slow motion. The purple fuzzball was the thing that like, he touched and then he became a god for a little bit. It's in the previous episode. Uh, I was aware of dirt settling in front of me. My fingers reached out for an acorn and struck my purple fuzzball against it and jammed, oh boy, them both into the saw worm's face. The saw worm went limp as its being went into the acorn. Right, you could, swip, you could swap souls with this thing. I put the fuzzball away and held up the acorn in my hand. A chipmunk came out from a hiding spot, sniffing the air. I tossed the acorn to the ground, and the chipmunk put it in its teeth, then scurried back into its hole. I picked up the abominant finger. Having left the saw worm clearing, I found a cool stream and drank deeply from it. The chilling cascade satisfied my dry throat. I washed my face, a baptism. When I opened my eyes, there was a green female child staring across the river. I froze. She watched me for a moment with her huge eyes. She took a couple steps back, staring at me the whole time. A smile broke across her face. I realized that she was challenging me to catch her. I had enough fairy stories to know that she was one that one should not chase little green girls into the forest. It cannot end well. I am Terzik. That's right, that's our hero's name. Terzik. I stood up and she took a few steps back, still watching me, still smiling. My intestines failed me. I shit right there on the floor. Sorry. <laughs> the right decision seemed to be the wrong one. The wrong decision seemed to be the right one. Who are you? I asked. This time she scowled at me, her eyebrows coming down, her nose wrinkled up in anger. She shook her head and waved her finger at me. The motion of her waving finger produced sparkles that traced on every gesture. The momentary hung in the air before dispatching. She took a few steps back, her smile returning. This time I took the bait and I chased her. Laughter exploded from her lips as she ran. Her laughter was so true and free that my heart was lifted from despair and the sound of it. And for the first time in a long time, I laughed. She was quick. My feet struggled to keep up, let alone gain on her. Then my feet found the beat of the forest like a rhythm in the woods and my body had to match. And when it when I did, my feet moved all the same more swiftly. That almost had a rhyme streak, but whatever. I also hate how the screen slowly dims. I hate that. I lost the little girl in the thicket. Unsure which way she went, I stopped to listen to her footfalls. A pine cone hit me right in the forehead, and I heard her giggle. 
I moved towards the sound of her voice. I caught a sight of her foot sticking out from behind a fern. The fern was shaking with laughter. I dove for her foot, grabbing it with both hands. My chest and face slammed into the rich black soil. She screamed with delight. The next instants were both on the ground, rolling and laughing. She helped me up. She smiled. I caught you, she said. It is not you who caught me. Hmm. I was surrounded on all sides by green people. They came out of the shadows of the trees and bushes watching us. The men among them hold boughs of long spears. A shimmer of sparkles hung in the air around them. I held my hands up in surrender. There were too many of them. I could not escape, even with the help of the abominant finger. The nearest of them motioned for me to lie down on the ground, which I did. I was kind of already there. One of the men left out, let out a laugh. I did not think the situation was funny at all. I scowled, which seemed to trigger even more laughter. The little girl got down next to me and imitated my position and scowl. More laughter. At all, <clears throat> all at once, the laughter stopped. Glaring around, I saw the people had all disappeared. When I turned back to the little girl, she was gone too. I got up on my knees and called out, Hello? A female voice replied. Did someone say hello? It was me, I answered. I think I had a voice for him, but I forget what it was at this point. Uh, nearby bushes were shaking. It sounded like she was having a difficult time making her way through them. Well, who is me? Asked the strangers. My name is Tuzerk. Who are you? I called back. Then she stepped out of the bushes and into the clearing. Her long brown hair parted and I saw her face. My heart stopped. It was Meva. Remember from before? He loves her. This is a meat cube. When worlds collide, are you ready to go? Are you... Remember that song? What are you doing here, Meva? I asked, trying to mask my excitement. She seemed puzzled by something, as if I had just woken her from a dream. I was supposed to meet my fiance. Right? My fiance? Is that what they're supposed to say? Jackson Rexon. Oh, I remember Jackson Rexon now. But he had a work emergency at the blank mind, and then I killed him. Her voice trailed off. Jackson Rexon? I mumbled. Yes, do you know him? I worked I worked in the blank mind. I, I knew him. Do you know what's happening? I nodded. Yes, I found something in the mind, something they desperately want. I will tell you everything, but you need to leave here before the green people come back. Mother grabbed my arm. Did you see the little green girl too? Yes. She continued, I was waiting for Jackson Rexon next to the forest when this little girl appeared. Uh, I followed her here. Me too. She made me get down on my knees and be quiet, or it looked like her fellow green people were going to kill me. Mova put something together in her mind. They disappeared, did they not? I nodded. It was as if they wanted us to find each other. Fate. These words were like fuel on the fire of my heart. It burned. <laughs> Here she was, standing before me, and she was perfect. Her face was perfect. It looked like a planet. Okay. No planets are too busy. Her face was like a moon, standing out in the darkness, pale and beautiful. You have a way with words, my friend. She waved her hand in front of my face. I realized she was talking while I was lost in admiration. Hello, Terzerk. What do you want me to do? Love you. Were the words that flew out of my mouth before I could pull them back. Love you. <laughs> I was embarrassed and terrified. My face turned red. I could not look at her. For a moment, I waited for her to strike me. Shut up. But she didn't. I pulled the slate from my pocket with her face on it, face scribed on it and held it up. This was going to sound crazy, no matter how it came down, but I had to say it. She had to know. Melva, good, we're getting recap of all the stuff I read in the other episode. I saw your image on Jackson Rexon's desk when I returned to work, and this, this, and image self-scribed on the cave walls. I know they came from me. My entire crew was in danger because I couldn't stop it. One of the members of my crew died from my passion for you. He gave his life to cover up my mistake. I happened and helped me escape. My love for you has sustained me in the darkness. 
She hadn't slapped me yet, so I continued. I will never be the same. Just seeing your face wrecked me for life. But my response to being ruined is not sadness, because it is a great joy to be heartbroken by you. Even now, if you want me to die, just give me the word and I will do so. Ask me to die. Ask me to move a mountain into the sea. Ask me anything on Reddit. Just don't, missing apostrophe, send me away. I tore the hem of my garment. Damn, I'm such a fool. I don't know how to use apostrophes. I can't believe I'm saying this to you. But I don't care. I don't care what you think or what anyone else thinks. I will never use apostrophes. I don't even care what I think. My soul was lost in the mountain and my body had no life in it. I could not wake until I heard your name. Meva, Meva, Meva! How your name is my favorite song. Let me sing it to you, Meva. Meva, 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 Meva. I held my arms out wide and sang as long as I could. Meva, 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 not caring who could hear me. There is a name that slays me in the name of love. There is a name that is a weapon of weapons. It sustained the soul of this man in the underworld, and it will sustain me forever in the overworld. I did not care if she responded. I was too terrified by the possibilities. But seeing my silence, she reached into her pocket of her skirt and pulled out a rock. She bashed me over the head with it. Good God! Uh, my heart burst, nearly burst. There, scribing the rocks, was my face. So she also had a blank. So they, their stories mirror each other. They're so in love. It's so adorable. The courting of Meva. Where did you get that? I asked in astonishment. She explained that the image of her face appeared all over the blank minds. Her father was alerted. They brought him a few pieces of the etched stones as evidence. My father demanded to know who had done it so the person could be punished, but Meva wanted to know for a different reason. She knew the tiles could not have... Pardon me emanated from Jackson Rexon because he did not love her. Marrying Neva would put Jackson Rexon in a better position to manipulate the blank mining operation. That's all he desired, not her. So Neva took one of the blanks with her face and visited her aunt, who was known as Witchy Lady. <laughs> Though, <laughs> sorry, through few and ha uh, Though few had courage to call her that to her face. Her aunt's predictions were a mixed bag. Sometimes she was right, but she was often wrong. This is known as random chance. At one time, she had been involved in guiding the mining operation to the richest vines or richest veins of blank slate. But after a few costly wrong predictions, she was no longer asked. But Meva was desperate, and she had no one else to turn. Her aunt flipped the tile over in her hands, running her finger along the edges. Then she gave Miva a blank title and told her to keep it close at all times, and the answer would come. This was not the answer Miva was hoping for. But she took the tile home and put it under her pillow. That night she dreamt that she was getting married to someone with no face. And when she awoke, my face was etched on the tile. When I heard this, I was in boredom. I took her hand and asked her to come with me. She nodded. I didn't know exactly where to go, so we chose a direction that was away from the mine. We stuck close to the main roads to avoid the wild animals in the deeper woods, but we didn't walk on the road in fear of capture. As the days wore on, the sound of the hover vehicle engines lessened, then ceased altogether. I remember one day in particular, we were walking over rolling hills that followed a river. I agreed, I agreed to play a game of sorts. We would take turns asking a question. The other person had to answer it with total honesty. She went first. Do you believe in love at first sight, Ter Terzerk? I said, I did not see how it could be true. How could someone love another when they had only seen her face? Love is more than infatuation. Love is more than a feeling. So how could the mere sight of another bring about such depth of commitment, self-sacrifice, and revelation. She reminded me 
that I was not supposed to be answering her question. I was supposed to be answering her question, not asking my own. So I told her, in earnest, that I had seen many pretty females before. I had seen the face etched into the blank, and it had almost been infatuation. But when I saw her face, it was different. Maybe not love, but not infatuation. I knew she was someone I needed to love. My turn. Do you love Jackson Rexon? I asked. She did not, but the marriage was something she agreed to because there was no alternative. Her family wanted it, his family wanted it. What was the point of resisting? But now things were different. He was dead. With the dream of my face edged onto a blank in her pocket. How did you become a minor? She asked. I feared her reaction to this question, but I told her anyway. I told her my two brothers and I were sold into servitude when I was very young. I told her how we ended up in mining, though my older brothers were near to being sent into the military. I told her about the day I got word that they had both died when a mine shaft collapsed on them. And so, not knowing anything about my parents, I was alone in the world. Do you love me? I asked. She took some time to think about her response, and then she said she wasn't sure. She needed to know me better. So I went between us that day. And so it went between us that day. And the day wore on, I realized that what I had felt at the sight of her face back in Jackson Rexon, <clears throat> excuse me, back in Jackson Rexon's office was changing, blossoming like a flower. If I had been back in that mine shaft with my hand on the wall, I could not have etched her face into the blanks. I would have etched her very soul. All right, chapter five. Look how bright it is. Punishment and crime. We came to an area where the terrain grew suddenly steep. We struggled to ascend, clutching at the trees with brushes to pull ourselves upward. The road off to our right was very tempting. It was seductive. But even though we were far from the mine, I figured, I still feared exposure if we walked openly on the road, so close to populated areas. We climbed over a particularly large boulder, only to be greeted by a wide area of broken stones. The trees and bushes were gone, leaving us exposed. It was no use hiking or hiding. We decided we might as well go up the road. I took Miva's hand and helped her up the slope up to the road. When we reached the top, she didn't let go. We walked hand in hand, arm in arm, the game of questions had grown sporadic, as our minds ran out of things to talk about, so we walked in silence, just happy to be together. Miva's footsteps had a different cadence than mine. I had the shuffle and kick that developed from walking through dust mine shafts. The shuffle was to make sure there was no unseen boulders in my path. The kick was to knock smaller rocks off the path as a courtesy to miners coming up from behind. Miva, however, glided on the ground with the grace that marched her, oh, matched her upbringing amid a class of valued poise, balance, and dance. We rounded the corner and there was a small army of royal guards who had been hiding alongside of the road. I hated myself for not being more vigilant. They were all highly trained, fully armed, strike-proof vested guards. There were two groups, one dressed in red and one dressed in black. It was a game of chess or checkers, damn it. Uh, their leader was the tallest one because they used the same uh, <laughs> choices as uh, the people in Invader Zim do. The one they called Baboot. He was the only one wearing both red and black. All of the faces were obscured by helmets sporting tall red plumes. Stop, commanded the one they call Baboot. We complied, Miva clutched my arm tightly. The one called Baboot quickly motioned to the guards dressed in red, calling out each other's names. Regiment Blood, Tackett, Staggett, uh, whatever. They say their names. I don't need to read Robo Burger, Robo Go Roger Goggles. I needed to read that one, I'm sorry. Uh, the red guards held up their hands to show the projectile needles strapped to their palms. 
like Iron Man, but knives. Step away from her! Baboot called out to me. They clearly knew who we were. We were pretty easy to identify, me in my dirty rags and Miva in her fine garments and upper class, a miner and a princess. I tried to step away from Miva, but she pulled me even tighter, then opened my cloak and pulled it around herself to block any shot that might come her way. No, you cannot shoot him without hitting me. Baboot chuckled, then nodded to the guards dressed in black and quickly called each of their names as they pointed their arms toward me. Regiment Death, Regiment Death, Dark Lith, Manruk, Fang, Laserheart, Edgar Bob Lemmings, Flipping Jankson, Elder Scoot, Oily Canoily, Marmoist Eclipse, Astromus Undershaft, Anthony A.J. Reed, Dr. Spot, Pawn Breath Havens. That was my exit, Louis. The Great F -f -f I had no doubt that there were good enough shots to hit me without harming Miva. Miva yelled again, if you shoot him, I will pluck the darts out of him and stab myself. Then, what will you tell my father as he removes your heads? Ooh. All the guards remained ready to fire, fire but hesitated. They looked at Baboot for direction, as they weren't sure what to do. The Devil Cross. Miva stabbed me. No, I'm kidding. Uh, the one called Baboot looked at Miva and said, is this not your kidnapper? Miva shouted at him, my father is my kidnapper. My ex-fiance, spelled correctly this time, is my kidnapper. Loneliness is my kidnapper. But this miner, oh, he's not my kidnapper. Baboot paused and then call, called out, to two of the guards, one from each group. To Nick, deathly. As the two guards stepped forward, Baboot ordered all of the others to return to their base. The small sense of relief I felt by the exit of the guards was quickly wiped away as the one called Baboot slowly leaned in to whisper to the two other guards. With eyes fixed on me, they were clearly formulating some sort of plan. Suddenly, the two guards charged at us. I pushed Mevo away. Run! I screamed. The first guard swung his needle fist at me. I ducked, bringing my fist up to into his stomach. He fell back, clutching himself, struggling for air. The second guard kicked out my legs and I fell on my back. He brought his needle down on me and I caught his wrist, stopping the needle just inches from my chest. We strained against each other for a moment. Suddenly, he went limp and rolled off me. I looked his baboot, standing over me with his needle hand pointed at me. But suddenly he lowered it. Then I realized he had shot both of the other guards. Needles protruded from their back. Meeva and I stood, stared puzzled looks. They shared puzzled looks. The one called Baboot took off his helmet, revealing long hair that fell free, almost reaching the ground. Quace. 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 That's a Q, right? It's not O-U-A, that's a... Quoice! Miva cried out and ran to her. They embraced. Later, Miva told me that Quoice had become one of her playmates when they were growing up. She had gotten her name when once she had bet her whole inheritance on single hand of cards and won with a Quoice. It's definitely a Q. It was clear to me in that moment that Miva was no ordinary person. In the company of Quace, she seemed elevated to her royal position again. They talked of nannies, summer cottages, ex exotic pets, traveling to meet dignitaries in other countries, and little sandwiches with the crust cut off. Finally, the conversation returned to the situation at hand. Quace told us that there was a massive hunt going on for us. A lifetime of wages had been promised to anyone who turned us in. The only condition was Miva must be brought in alive and I must be brought in dead. Quace opened a map and showed us the placement of the guards and which areas to avoid. Luckily, the search was con uh, concentrated away from us because they thought I was heading in the opposite direction. 
Quace knew of a safe house that at one time belonged to an old widow who later died of food poisoning. Okay. <laughs> Miva was puzzled by this news and asked how Quace knew of this safe house. For years, Quace worked with a criminal back, criminal underground, what? Helping thieves escape the royal family's dungeons. Miva was stunned at first, but realized this could work in our favor. Quace told us there was one problem with the safe house. If we stayed in it for more than two days, we would be transformed into baby goats. Okay. Miva pointed her finger up the river on the map, not far from the safe house. Quace told us to find a boat and flown down to the town of Grint. The town was rural. There were many outsiders came to buy and sell, so we could not stand out. Then we could make our own way to yet another cottage in the mountains. That place was even more rural, so no one would find us as long as we wanted to stay. And we wouldn't be turned into baby goats. No apostrophe in wooden. Quace gave up the map. Uh, I took the backpacks from the dead guards, giving one to Miva and talking to the other one myself. Miva and Quace hugged each other. Quace begged forgiveness for her treachery. Miva said, I cannot pardon you as a member of the royal family, but I do as a friend. They embraced and we left Quace standing there alone in the road. We got off the main path at the point Quace indicated on the map. For several days, we threaded our way through the trees and over streams until finally we reached the safe house. They spent several days going to a place they can only spend two days at. It was a simple slack of wood with a roof of straw inside. The air smelled of mold. The floor was bare dirt. The walls were covered with simple paintings of goats. A fireplace made of slacked stones towered up through the thatch roof. I couldn't imagine anyone staying long even without the threat of turning into a baby goat. Using blankets from the guard packs, I made a bed for Miva beside the fireplace and a second for myself in front of the door. That night, as I laid in bed watching the light of the fire dance across the tangled straw of the ceiling, I thought about what Miva had done to protect me. For the guards, their needles. Finally, I asked her the question I had not found myself the courage to ask before. Do you want your dream of marriage to come true for us? Are you asking me to marry you, Tzirk? I thought for a moment. I was nobody, a lowly miner, and she was not only royal blood, but beautiful and true. No, I couldn't think of that. I squeezed my eyes shut. Miva, will you marry me? I will. The boat! We left the safe house the next day. Although Quace said that we could stay two days. Neither of us wanted to risk turning into a baby goat. Fair. Fair play. Avoiding the trails, we made our own way. We made our own way down the river. Quace had shown us on the map. We reached the river and turned, following it downstream, hoping to find a boat. After several hours, we did find a boat tethered to a tree with two oars inside. It seemed like the boat was there just for us, but I suppose that is what anyone who steals says. Yeah. I helped Miva into the boat and climbed in myself. Cutting the rope, I rowed out into the main current of the stream. After that, the current did not work for us. The significance of grit. Look how dark this has gotten. Uh, I got a text from my dad. <laughs> uh, yeah. Nice text from my dad. Uh, where was I? Uh, our boat just to remember right. Miva stepped on my chest mumbling in her dreams. Her eyes darted back and forth under her eyelids. The only word I could understand was, I am giant. And then she would sigh and be silent again. 
All right. <laughs> the Quatta Crane cropped its head back, poised to spear a passing flil frog or fillflish. Cool words. The water stirred a few feet in front of him, and the sterling whirling away from him. <clears throat> then closer, meandering this way, then that before the hunter's beak blurted into the water and ended the dance. I caught neither a fiddle frog or a fiddle fish. Instead, I gulped down a younger quadraclane. Man, I really wish this was brighter, because it's hard to see. The shadow came up. Oh my god. The sun came up, and a shadow came uh, over cast from a bridge. This is the last chapter I'm reading. I'm starting to, I'm starting to flag. We were near a small town, probably Grint. Grint was an agriculture town. Farmers brought it, their wares there to sell. It could be a good place for us to find food and satisfy our grumbling bellies. Once past the bridge, I pulled our boat up into the shore. I hid it in a clump of trees. Uh, we made sure the boat was hit just in case those who pursued us were looking along the river. We climbed up the banks over the boulders, busting a bustling farmer's market unfurled before us. We tried to blend in, though seemingly unnecessary, for no one paid for any attention to us. Miva found an arrow fruit vendor and gave him a few coins to for two potions of two potions of fruit. The people of Grint could be heard whistling a tune that was their that was their anthem. Try that again. The people of Grint could be heard whistling a tune that was their anthem. That see how that made sense? I tried to whistle it too, but not to deceive them from thinking I was one of them. No outsider could whistle a town's theme in quite the same way as the locals, but trying to whistle the tune meant that you were friendly, and that you deferred to the local cultures and traditions out of respect. Attempting to whistle the local tune might gain a shopkeeper's favor and find his prices may suddenly come down for you, or the local law enforcement may choose not to stop you or harass you. I gripped Miva's hand and pulled it close to my chest. I loved the way she tucked her head against my shoulders. Her feet now walked in rhythm and that matched my own, so she could remain close to me. My cloak nearly covered her to people who might look at us from the side. Miva, look, wrong way. Uh, Miva looked back over my shoulder, so finally I asked her what she was looking at. Her eyes darted to me and then back over my shoulder. Is that a temple up there? I turned and saw a rectangular building that twisted up into the air. It had little windows cut into slots and a ring of gold spice ador spikes adorning the top of it like a crown. She continued, they're performing marriages up there. I don't know. I did not know much about these temples. Are you saying that you want? Are you saying that you want toll me now? That is what that says, right? Are you saying that you want toll me now? She smiled. My heart skipped a beat. She wanted to toll me now. We hiked up to the temple and came before the priest. I had a distrust of priests, simply because priests were picked in a secret ceremony behind doors, and nobody knew the criteria for what made them selected. This always bothered me, though it had been done for thousands of years. He addressed me first. Sir Zerk, I do not know you, so forgive me if I ask you questions I ought to know if we were members of the same congregation. Uh, I'm not a member of your, any congregation, I said hoping to tweak him a, just a little. He ignored my comment and put a hand on my shoulder. You know, you are known as Tzirk? I am. He gestured to Miva. You are known as Miva? I am. He turned back and asked, Tzirk, will you forsake all others? I will. Will you keep Miva the focus of your desire? I will. Will you be a loving father to your children? I will. Presumptuous. We might not have kids, but whatever. Finally, will you die for her? Without hesitation, I said. He shot me in the face. Kidding. 
Uh, he took his hand off my shoulder and put his hands together. This was a gesture that my role was to be performed regardless of her oath. Interesting. Neva, will you forsake all others? I will. Will you remind Tuzerk of the complexities of life? I will. Uh, will you only bear the children of Tuzerk and no other? I will. Again, presumption. Finally, will you submit to him? Will you, will you deter him to... What? Will you defer to him in any conflict? With, with hesitation, she said. Cool. I like that. I will submit to him with hesitation. He declared us married. You know, that could just be a misprint. There's been so many misspellings and stuff in this, but I don't know. He declared us married. The color began to drain out of me and into her through her right hand. Her color did the same, moving into my right hand, then up my arm as my own color receded. When the colors had been exchanged, we kissed. Okay, so, something, some new thing I don't understand about marriages in this game. The priest escorted us to, to a narrow door to the back of the temple, used only by newlyweds, such as ourselves. The path beyond was rocky and twisted. It was often so difficult that we had to help each other to continue. Finally, it ended in a small garden with a spring of cool running water, leaving Grint. We left Grint, the food in our packs replenished, and our hearts united. Miva recognized an area on the map called the Valley of the Dork. Her grandfather had taken her there many years before, when she was a child. It was only a vague memory to her, but because of its connection to her grandfather, it was special. I knew she wished to go there, so we took a detour to see the valley as part of our honeymoon. The Valley of Dork. I told Miva about my experience of becoming the mountain and showed her the purple fuzzball. But I did not let her touch it. The extent of its power was unclear. What if she touched it and was transferred into a grain of sand? How could I ever find her again? Miva told me that it was her grandfather who started the search for the legendary heart of the mountain many years ago before that the purple fuzzball. He had convinced the mining company to dig for it, promising them that they would find it once his soul was safely transformed into a younger, more virile body. I started thinking of a device that could control the heart of the mountain's soul, transferring its powers. But even though I was a capable builder, I didn't know how to make a device. Miva knew of a tribe of rock beings called Dork, who lived in secret. They were the guardians of the mountains. I'm losing my voice. Uh, Miva's grandfather had signed a treaty with them, which allowed blank mining crews to dig the rich vines, the richest veins, which, while avoiding the dorks, sacred chambers. Her grandfather had honored every word of the treaty. It was like the company being able to mine where so many others had failed. Previous companies had tried to dig further and deeper without the approval of the Dork. Then, the mining would inevitably break into a sacred Dork chamber. The drunk would demand the operation stops. Fighting would break out, and the drunk would always... And the drunk always won. Drunk. It's a tough one. I'm tough for time with that word for some reason. They were, after all, made of rock. If you smell what the rocks go. Miva said the drunk were capable of building complex mechanical structures from magical rock. They had a mysterious and powerful device that allowed them to create nearly anything. This could be just what we needed to house and control the purple fuzzball. We have three chapters left. And I'm going to call it here because my voice hurts. I'm getting over a cold. But hey, we're, we're back to a, a normal streaming schedule now. I don't know when this will go up on YouTube. But uh, if you're hanging out in the chat still, uh, we're going to start streaming four, or, yeah, four days a week. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Monday will currently be like the big story game, which right now is this one. 
Uh, we're going to use Tuesday for solving riddles. So it'll either be MatPat's Game Theory Riddle, the Not Prawn Riddle, or if I've somehow completed the Not Prawn Riddle by now, uh, something else puzzly related. The Thursday show will be the Super Meat Boy Super Completionist Run, where I beat every game mentioned in Super Meat Boy before me beating Super Meat Boy. It's very confusing. Just watch. It'll be fun. And then on Friday, it's a uh, suggestions and viewers' choice. So it'll be one-offs. It'll be a bunch of weird stuff. So be sure to join us for that. It's going to be super fun. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to follow us here on Twitch and to subscribe on YouTube for more content like this. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Boop! If you want more of this very strange point-and-click puzzly adventure, be sure to subscribe to Plus Two Comedy Gaming. And you can also check out some of the other games we play here. They're, they're fun, too. And uh, also, I'm doing this with a broken microphone, so I'm sorry if this sounds weird. But if you want to join me live on Twitch, I'm Plus Two Comedy on Twitch as well. That is Plus the Number Two Comedy. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you next time. Boop!